11, so I guess we can try. So my name is Siddharth. Uh, my French shortened it to Sid some time ago. Um, if you register for the course, you have access to the whole syllabus, which has all my contact information. So I'll go through all of that. Uh, my email is also on there. Verma S at So um, I think we're divided half and half. So half the people are in person and half of the students are distance learning. Uh, so I have to keep writing everything down because just so I don't forget. Um, let me uh, open. So some of us are new here, so we don't might not be familiar with Canvas. Canvas is okay. So canvas.fau.edu. Uh, you already have. Okay, I have to call Gordon. Um, just wait. Should I bring the DVI adapter? Do you have a DVI adapter? I have a DVI, uh, let's see. Yeah, I think I do. Give me one second. <laughs> I should have asked him for the password on
that's okay. I can use the other computer. If you could just sign on. You can sign on with your own user and password. Okay. Try it. Yes, thank you. I was saying there's canvas.epignet.eu where uh, I'll post all of the homework, all of the projects, and um, you can even submit your codes and your PDFs online directly. So let's go take a look at it. have access to one of the classes depending on which section you're registered in. So let me go to one of them. They're identical. And uh, the first thing that you should take a look at is uh, the syllabus. The PDFs right here. And it basically has a list on the bottom of the topics that we will cover uh, week by week. Um, most of the basic stuff is in the beginning, and we might have to expand out uh, how, how, how many days we spend on this stuff. So, uh, but the, the later part contains more advanced stuff. But as long as you know the basics really well, the advanced stuff you could learn on your own. Um, the, let's go through this very quickly. So yeah, all my contact information is right there. We will have office hours Mondays and Wednesdays, 3.30 to 4.30. My office is here at CTEC. Uh, if you're in distance learning, you can, uh, we could set up a Skype during these times, or if any of you cannot make these times for some reason, email me, we can set up another time. Uh, I will be assuming that you know how to program. Uh, you cannot learn CFP without programming yourself, making mistakes yourself, writing bugs yourself, fixing them. So you must know at least what a for loop is, what a if condition is. If you know those things, I think you should be okay. Uh, some basic fluid mechanics and uh, differential equations. So as long as you know a little bit, that's enough. Uh, we will review some of the stuff uh, in the class. And there's no tests or exams. Okay? All of your grade is dependent on homework and on project. There will, I think I'll assign about three homeworks, but most of your grade will come from the projects. I'm thinking of five to six projects. Projects, I mean just uh, assignments that involve a lot of coding. And if you like, you can do an extra credit project towards the end. Uh, the grading scheme is over here. If the grade is lower than a B minus, we will curve it. And let's see what else. Ah, the textbook. So if you don't want to buy the textbook, don't buy it. Uh, because this textbook is available to you for free from the library. Okay. So it's an ebook, um, and you can download it for, I think, a maximum of 21 days, and you can renew it an infinite number of times. Yeah, so right there. So that's the ebook. You can just download the PDF. Okay. That's one of the books. That's has most of the basic stuff in there. And there's another very nice book by Lebec that also you have available as an ebook. book There, yeah, 
So there also you can download the PDF. And then there's a very nice book that I used when I was learning. This one uh, is CFD by John D. Anderson. But now it's out of print. So I wanted to use this book, but he died. You can barely find any copies anymore. Uh, if you'd like to take a look, uh, you can come by after class. OK, let's see. So any questions at this point? No? All right. So the things that we will learn here, actually, we can go to for some of the videos. OK, so the things we will learn here are will be very basic things. It's the building blocks of CFD. And you might already have used CFD in a commercial software or an open source software for your research, right? But the idea here is to learn what exactly goes on behind the scenes, what, what sort of schemes the software might be using. Is that a good scheme to use for your problem? So if you know that, you can use these softwares very much more effectively. Or if you want, you can write your own. Um, so for instance, you could look at, I'll just show you some examples. Okay? Uh, this was when we were looking at mixing between, for instance, you might have pure fuel on top and pure air on the bottom. And there's a mixing layer, uh, this a jet that <coughs> at the interface you get mixing. So you can study how uh, the two things mix. And you need to have uh, you need to have the two things mixed well if you want efficient combustion. Another thing you might look at is how fish schooling might be beneficial to save energy. Uh, for instance, these weight structures that come off of leading fish could be used by the followers to extract energy. Okay? That's another problem. You might also consider very basic scientific studies of what happens in turbulent flow. Uh, when you drive a car, when you fly in planes or in ships, there's always so. There's always flow, wall bounded flow, right? There's always flow right next to a wall. And this is a visualization of what the uh, flow structures look like close to a flat wall. The black plane is the flat wall. And then you can start thinking about how you could change these structures to reduce drag. And that can lead to enormous fuel savings. This is a huge problem that people have been trying to solve for decades. You can even look at how nature might have optimized behavior in animals. So if you've ever noticed in an aquarium, fish never swim continuously. They always eat their tails a few times and then glide further. And you can use simulations and couple them with optimization to see how this might be used to swim very efficiently or swim very fast. And you'll see there's no very noticeable difference in the behavior of it. And this, the one on top looks very similar to what you might observe in an aquarium. And again, efficiency is not the only thing that might be governed in this. It might be that coasting for a while helps them to uh, perceive their environment better by sensing the flow around them or by looking at objects. So there's many, many things you can look at. Uh, if you want more examples of what you could do, uh, where is this canvas? You can actually go and take a look at some of the links that I've put up. It's, you should already have access to it. It's called Homer Zero. 
uh, 0 0.0 does not count towards the array. Okay? So it's basically just a bunch of uh, YouTube links that uh, show various scenarios in which CFT might be used. I mean, in some videos about uh, high performance computing and fluid mechanics in general. And then there's some useful commands in MATLAB that you can take a look at and some visualization. Again, this is just for you, not you, you don't have to submit anything. Okay. So, any questions at this point? No. All right, so um, when we start looking at CFTs, the emphasis will be on coding and on theory. We need a good balance of both things. So, if you don't know the theory, you might put up something that's saying, all right, if you don't write code and you know the theory, you don't know how things actually work, right? You never know how things actually work until you try them, make mistakes, and fix your mistakes, okay? So a lot of the emphasis will be on code. Um, in terms of collaborating for homework and projects, Please work with each other, help each other, learn from each other, but don't copy. No copy based. It's very easy to spot uh, code that's in copy. And also, we'll be using version control. I'll, I'll tell you more about what it actually is later on. Next class, maybe next week. And uh, it's very easy to spot because it involves uh, you. Every time you make a change, you have to write down comments. So there, it becomes very easy to spot. Copy paste. Okay. And anytime you don't understand anything, please stop me. Okay. When you enter the door, leave your shame outside. Uh, we're all here to learn. Okay. You give a wrong answer, nobody cares. Okay. As long as you learn, that's all that matters. Uh, it might be that. The notation you have learned in the past might be slightly different from what I use. So, especially in that case, and you don't understand something, stop me right away. Okay. Uh, because there's a good chance if you don't get it, there's at least one other person who might also be confused. Okay, so, all right. That was, in, I think, everything in terms of introduction. Um, so, if you don't have any questions at this point, I guess we can start with some basic notation. No questions? Okay. So, when you start doing numerics, you have to know what the differential equations actually mean physically okay, before you start discretizing. So it's very important to get a very fundamental understanding of the basic laws. The most important ones are conservation of mass and conservation of momentum. Uh, some problems that you look at might also involve uh, conservation of energy, but we might not get into that uh, in this course. So just some basic notation. Let me see. Okay. Anytime I write down stuff, uh, scalars will be just simple uh, variables. With, for a vector, I usually put a bar underneath, and for a tensor, two bars. Okay, phi can be whatever. It can be velocity or concentration or anything you want. Um, also, Nabla phi is also called the gradient operator. Nabla or rad is just del phi by del x, i plus del phi by del y, j plus del phi by del z. And phi can be a function of x, y, z, and time. Okay. Three dimensional in space and in 
Uh, another way you might write this is this del phi by del x, del phi by del y. Okay. And another possibility is just phi comma x, phi comma y, phi comma z. So anytime you see a comma x, that means partial derivative with respect to the x or y further. Okay. So that should all be relatively familiar to you. Okay. Um, so let's see. What happens if I do matplot dot phi? So this is just all divergence. Okay. You tell me. What is that? Phi, uh, scalar, vector, or tensor? Scalar here. Yeah, so that means this is not defined for this. Okay. What you said would be exactly right if I had this, right? Then it's just del phi by del x plus del phi. Y by del y plus phi z by del x. So the x component, y component, and the z component. Okay. Maybe just write there. Phi is phi x i plus phi y j plus phi z k. In a more uh, uh, familiar notation, you might have. Uh, U, U vector is UI plus DJ plus WJ. Okay. Just with UB, XYZ component. Okay. Now, if we take this one step further and go to gradient of So you notice that there's no dots in between. It's a very small difference, but a huge uh, result in the end. So this is actually phi x comma x, phi y comma x, phi x comma y, phi x comma z. And in the second row, you have phi y comma x, phi y comma y, phi y z. The third row, you have phi z comma x. Okay, so just with these few operators, we basically know almost everything we need to for doing fluid mechanics. You've seen this before. If you haven't, then it's not very, uh, there's not a lot involved. It's just notation. Ah, and this is, this is called a tensor. Using this, we can take a look at conservation of mass. And again, this is more of a, wait, do you need this? All right. Uh, quick question. Yeah. Please. Are those uh, subscripts of x, y, and z's for that tensor? Or is it on the same line? Which one? Uh, uh, any of those are uh, the x. So this is the x component of the vector? Right, is it a subscript? Or yeah, yeah, it? yeah, it's a subscript. Yeah, by subscript. So, uh, no, this whole thing is a subscript. Okay. Okay, so now we know what this notation means. We can look at the first conservation law, which is conservation law. <coughs> okay. Mass. 
lambda dot q equals zero. Zero by d t. Actually, let's start with incompressibility. They are related, um, and we'll see how. D, D, D. Okay, so incompressibility means these two things. Which one of these is correct? Uh, in case you are not familiar, this is density. This is just the velocity vector. Which one is means incompressible? Incompressible one. The second one. The second one. And the first one. The result. Is the result. Yeah. So, whenever you see either of these two, it means the flow is incompressible. Now, in layman terms, what does incompressibility mean? What is incompressibility? Tell me. Once, once more? Ah, I thought you were okay. Anybody? Wrong answer, right answer? Don't care. Try it. Can't be compressed. <coughs> what? The fluid or what can't be compressed? Yeah. In layman terms, fluid the fluid cannot be compressed. Its density cannot change. That's what this thing is saying. The density the row of a material element does not change. Now, what is a material element? It's a very, very elegant concept that took me quite a while to understand when I was learning. Okay. So uh, let's say you have a flow through a channel, okay? And there is one blob of fluid that you decide you're going to follow, right? So this packet or blob of fluid Call the material element. Okay. Now, for observing this block of fluid, you can, you have two options. Either you stay here, let's say, stand in the lap frame and look at what's happening to the block, or you jump on the block and go with it. It's very similar to if you have. Uh, camera recording an F1 race, right? It's uh, ground camera versus uh, helmet mounted camera, right? So the helmet mounted camera would be the Lagrangian viewpoint, and the ground camera would be the uh, Eulerian viewpoint. Okay. So, d by dt of anything is called the material derivative. And this expands out to partial derivative in time plus the advective term. And let's keep it simple for now. Okay. So capital B by capital D T expands out to these two terms. Okay. What does this mean? If we go along with uh, density, this is just del rho by del t plus 
you tell rho by del x. Let's assume we are just dealing with uh, one dimensional flow, okay? And only in that can be exploration. So the rate of change of density in the whole block is happens due to two things. The density might be changing in time, but also the uh, density which might change. Would you mind sliding the paper up? Once more? Would you mind sliding the paper up here? On oh, the oh, sorry. Thanks. Yeah. All right. So the density of the whole block might be changing because of two reasons. The density changes in time and the density changes because of advection. Okay, and let me draw another channel over here. So if we have a channel that's at, let's say, 20 degrees centigrade on this side and uh, 80 degrees centigrade on this side because you're heating it, okay? Uh, That might be heat source, okay? And let's say, you know, it increases linear. So it's 20, 30, 40, and it goes all the way up to 80. So this tells you that as the blob moves along, the molecules inside are getting heated up and the density is changing. That's happening because of convection. If the block were not moving left or right, the density would not change, okay? How can the density change in time? Give me an example. What, what is one possibility? The, uh, the partial derivative, I mean. Something is changing its density in time. Think of... Uh, Radioactive decay, right? That's a good example where an element basically changes its mass by uh, emitting alpha particles or uh, beta radiation. So that's one possibility is radiation, right? So that's just a very simple example to understand uh, material derivatives, basically. And this doesn't apply just for rho. It applies to any variable you can think of. Well, later on, we'll see in conservation of momentum, you actually have P u by dt, u vector. Okay. Uh, that's the whole left side of the Navier-Stokes equation. So this is what uh, material derivative means. Okay. So, going back to incompressibility, we said that the density of the fluid block cannot change, either due to time changes or due to advection. Okay. So, now the question is, how do we get this left-hand side from this right-hand side, lambda dot u equals zero? This was incompressibility, and to see where that comes from, now we will look at conservation of mass. Tell me if I uh, change the pages to read to fast. Okay. Again, think of that small block, right? Conservation of mass just says that uh, the mass of that block cannot change in time. And what is mass? Mass is just uh, the volume integral of rho. Right? Um, there's the time derivative is outside the integral. Okay. How do I get it inside? 
Should I just put it in and then rewind? So is this the same as t by dt of rho dt? If you draw control volumes and look at fluxes in and out, what you can do is you can actually prove that d by dt of anything, basically, here in this case we have rho dt, is equal to um, a, it's del rho by del t and the flux, yeah. So, let me look at the exact expression. <coughs> Equal to this. This is called the Reynolds transport here. If you want, you can check the derivation matrix. I think it's in the book, it's on Wikipedia, it's on Google. Okay, so this doesn't need to be rho, it can be phi, it can be u, whatever. You will always expand the left hand side as shown on the right hand side. So, now, uh, do you recognize this integral? We have one little problem here, right? This, so this is called the integral part. And we're trying to go to the differential form, uh, which the, most of the numerics we do will be on the differential form. Okay. So we need to get to that TDE before we can start cleaning up. Okay. I will discretize it like this. So going from the integral form to the differential form, uh, we've come up to here. Now one problem is I want to combine these two terms, but I cannot. One of them is a volume integral, the other is a, an area or a surface integral. Do you remember how you change a uh, surface integral that looks like this into a volume integral? Divergence theorem. Yeah, divergence theorem, Gauss theorem. Okay. So, divergence theorem or Gauss theorem. This when you represent it as a volume integral, it just becomes that. Tabla dot u rho dA, at dB. That's, again, the, oh, uh, it's a mathematical identity. Uh, the surface integral is changing into the volume integral. Okay, so now we can combine the two terms. We can basically say so this is equal to the triple integral of del rho by del u plus rho tabla dot u dt. Uh, 
It should be, the row should be inside. Yeah, the row here should be inside. Started from P M by D. So this this rate of change of mass is basically this. So P we started with the integral form and then we use the Reynolds transport theorem and then we use the divergence theorem and then we get this equation. Okay? So if you say rate of change of mass is zero, that's just saying that del rho by del T plus tabla dot rho u is equal to zero. Right? That's just this whole thing inside. Okay. And now we have del rho by del t plus. Uh, when you use chain rule here, it just becomes um, u dot nabla rho plus uh, rho nabla dot u. Okay, I'll just expand this. Okay, now do things look familiar? There's a partial derivative in time, there looks like an effective term and something else. Okay. Uh, uh, again, nabla rho is in general, in 3D. Okay? If it were 1D, this would just be del rho by del x. Okay. So, tell me, what looks familiar? The material derivative. Yeah. The first two terms here are basically what we just talked about, the material derivative. This is the partial derivative in time. This is the effective term. Okay. So this becomes T rho by D T plus rho nabla dot U equals zero. Okay, I just combine this. Incompressibility means means what? <coughs> the material derivative of rho is zero. Which implies that rho nabla dot u must also be zero. Which implies either rho is zero or nabla dot u is zero. This is how you get the uh, Divergence free flow. Okay, make sense? So, all of this derivation I'm showing you is just for you to know where things come from. Okay, and once you know that, then you can always look it up, right? Uh, the most important thing from here will be we will learn how to use nabla.u equals zero in the CFD simulations, okay? Uh, this is one of the most uh, problematic uh, conditions to satisfy in incompressible simulations. It's the most time consuming. We, we will see how, how that happens eventually. Okay, so incompressible flow means either D rho by DT, capital D, is zero, or nabla dot U, the divergence of velocity is zero. Okay. Um, is there any way we can relate this to uh, the volume? Uh, uh, before that, a uh, uh, simpler question is, in the incompressible flow, we know density does not change. 
we know mass does not change, which automatically means the volume must not change, right? But in compressible flow, you can relate the two things, and we can very easily see how that happens. Uh, can I go to the paper? So, how is tabla dot u related to volume change? For that, let's again go back to this material element, okay? this small block of fluid. We can uh, we can again use conservation of mass, and we can say that um, d m not okay over d. Let's say where M naught is the initial mass of the blob or material element. And this is equal to D pro D naught. Mass is just rho b, and d naught is the initial volume. Okay, and we have said that this should be equal to zero. So again, we use chain rule here, so we have d rho by d t d naught plus rho d d naught by d t equal zero. Okay, d rho by d t or minus rho over d naught d t naught by d t. What were we trying to do? We are trying to relate divergence mm -hmm. to rate of change of volume. Now, um, we just derived conservation of mass using d rho by dt and nabla dot u. Okay, where, where, where's that? Here. And now we're trying to relate nabla dot u and rate of change of volume. So we can use these two things, right? We can just replace the d rho by dt with minus rho nabla dot u equal the right hand side. And then we have that the divergence physically, this means rate of change of volume of the material element divided by the initial volume. Make sense? Can you move the paper up, please? Sure. Good. Uh, just to not confuse you, this comes from since d rho by dt plus rho nabla dot u is equal to zero from conservation of mass. So, fine. Uh, mathematically, we all know what nabla dot u means. Just du by dx, db by dx, dy, plus dw by dz is equal to to but physically, what does it mean? Physically, it means the rate of change of a small area, uh, rate of change of the volume in a small area that you might be looking at. Okay. So if you think of sinks and sources, you might have had a potential flow, right? There we deal with sources that, uh, you know, spew out fluid and you have sinks where the fluid is basically getting sucked in. So here, nabla dot u, is it zero or not zero? <clears throat> if I have an 
enclosed cell and then the source and sink is in there. Let's say we have a box and the source is basically a pipe that's pumping in water, right? Not water, let's say air. Water is very hard to compress. So you keep pumping in air, the pressure will slowly keep rising. What's happening to the air inside? What? Yeah, it's getting compressed, right? Its density is changing. And that you can relate to uh, the divergence. Okay? You can actually compute what the divergence is, and you will see that everything uh, comes together in the end. Okay? There's all these different equations, but everything is related. There's only two basic laws that everything follows. Conservation mass, conservation momentum. Conservation energy also. We, we, we might not deal with that in the course. Okay, so that's a lot of mathematics. Let's go on to some more fun stuff, uh, discretizing equations. Uh, but before that, do you have any questions? This was basically a review of what you might have already seen in uh, uh, other tools courses. Okay, so. We can take a look at a very nice and simple equation called the heat equation. You might have dealt with this in other courses, but you may expose me to So let's see. This is just uh, del times T. Yeah, that means <coughs> temperature. Uh, that's, uh, should I have the effective term? No, I don't want to have that. Let's say kappa nabla squared t. Ah, nabla squared. So what is nabla squared? Um, Before that, I keep mentioning discretization. What do I mean by that? What is discretization? Why, why is it necessary? Whenever we solve ODEs or PTEs analytically, it's always a continuous solve, right? We don't care about looking at small elements, right? Uh, well, in during integration, we do, but. Um, the main problem with computers is you cannot do continuous mathematics. Right? Everything has to be stored at a particular location. So for instance, if we were looking at our channel, where is the channel? Yeah. If we were looking at our channel here and we were trying to solve the flow and size, what we would do is break this up into small cells. Okay. And each cell basically has an xy coordinate, and we store values at this xy coordinate, let's say u, v, w. So the computer cannot do continuous mathematics. So we have to supply this information to the computer in the discretized form. The most general way we will do this is we will say index 1 has coordinate x, coordinate y, u, v, w, right? Index 2 has this other value, okay? So that's what discretization means. And we can look at a very simple example using this heat equation, okay? A simple example is, let's say, a straight rod, a very thin straight rod. Here, if I give you initial conditions and boundary conditions, Can you solve the PDE for me? <coughs> this you might have done in a mathematics course a while ago. Okay. But uh, uh, before that, do you know what this nabla squared means? I 
Have you seen that before? Yeah? Yeah, it's called the Laplacian, right? And this is just L2 G by L X squared plus L2 G by X squared plus L2 G by L Z squared. Does uh, T have to be a vector, scalar, tensor? Think about it. What is T here? What did we say it physically represents? Temperature, right? What is temperature? Yeah. Temperature is a scalar. So the, the, the Laplacian operator works fine for scalars because this actually expands out as nabla dot nabla t. Okay? So it's the divergence of the radiant of a variable, which means it's the divergence of the z by the x the p by the y j, the p by the x j, and so this is a vector, and we know how to take divergence of a vector. So we take the derivative of the x component with respect to x plus derivative of y component with respect to y. back to our problem. If I give you that the initial temperature profile in the rod looks a certain way and the boundary conditions are a certain uh, set of equations, you can then at that point you can start trying to solve the equation. Okay? So forgetting about mathematics, if we just think about what happens to a rod. If we have a rod and we say we will heat it up so the profile looks something like this. So this is the initial temperature looks like this. Okay? Initial temperature. And then I will tell you that I'm going to insulate the ends perfectly. No heat is allowed to go out or in. Caring about mathematics at all, what is going to happen? I have a metallic rod and I heat it up. The temperature profile, if you measure with the thermometer, looks like this. I will not allow any heat to go in and out of the ends. As time passes, what will happen? The temperature in the rod will become uniform? Yeah, the temperature will become uniform. This peak will slowly start going down. The ends here will start rising up. And if everything is flat, right? So, we will get that the final profile looks something like Once the temperature profile is flat, it will not change in that. And all of this we can relate to the differential equation that we have seen. We will see how that happens one by one. Before that, is there some way, again, without knowing differential equations, that I could potentially figure out what this value is going to be? Is equal to how many degrees, let's say, 
50 degrees, centigrade, 100. For that, I need to know one more piece of information, which I have not given you yet. What could that in piece of information be? The uh, temp initial maximum temperature in the middle of the rod. So the initial maximum temperature here, is that sufficient? Let's say that's 1,000 degrees. Again, you don't need a lot of mathematics. It all happens in, in terms of what is conserved, what is not conserved. So your, your answer was, if I know the peak here, I will be able to know what the uniform temperature is. Is that enough? Do you need more? The length of the rod. What's more? The length of the rod. Uh, I'm sorry. The length of the rod. The length of the rod, yeah, okay. The length of the rod is also necessary, yes. But the most important thing is you need to know the integral under this area, right? That's the total heat content in the rod, right? That's, and for that, that's exactly what both of you were saying. You need to know the peak here, and if I say it's a Gaussian, you know, if I give you the peak, you can probably draw the profile, and you need to know the length of the rod to integrate from zero to L, and that gives you the total area under this curve, temperature curve. So, you know you're not allowing any heat to escape from the ends, so the total uh, heat should not change heat content of the rod. And from that, you can figure out what the final, uh, uh, the final temperature will be. For that, you just multiply the length by the final temperature. That gives you the area to where it should be. Okay. This is, in, in reality, will this be true? If I just have a rod and I heat it up and I let it go, will it go down to, let's say, 50 degrees and stay there? Forever. Why not? Uh, heat leaving the surface of the rod besides the end traps? Yeah, there is convection through air from the surface of the rod, there's radiation, there's all sorts of losses in practice. Right? But if we are able to suppress all of those, yes, that will happen. It will stay at 50 degrees centigrade for all eternity. Okay. Uh, now, we said that, okay, this sort of evolution of the temperature, we can figure out using mathematics. Okay, how, how do we do that? This is the equation that governs, I'm just rewriting the, the heat equation now on, from the top of the page. Okay, so this is the equation that governs how temperature evolves in this rock. The, let's look at the simple problem first. Steady state. What does steady state mean? Mathematically, what does steady state mean? The, uh, delta T, delta T, or change in temperature with respect to time is zero? Yeah, exactly. Steady state means rate of change with respect to time is zero. Del T by del T equals zero. Okay? Which will happen if kappa nabla square T equals zero. Which means nabla square T equals zero. Okay? So at steady state, this condition has to be satisfied. And if you see, if we have a flat line, this condition is satisfied. This is basically a curvature of T, right? And curvature of T in this case is zero. Now you might say, okay, why not a line with a different slope? And <coughs> that's an interesting question. Yeah. Why not line with a different slope? Okay. So mathematically, the nabla square t equals zero is necessary for a steady state. And physically, this means curvature 
order of t is 0. Which means t is a straight line. All that is just facts of the line. Okay? Now, but which straight line? There's an infinite number of possibilities, right? The straight line can, can look like this, can look like this. So anything uh, in between, right? What is the slope? Intuitively, we figured out that it should be a flat line, okay? But how, how do we show that mathematically? It should be a flat straight line. Uh, give you a hint, which is the ends are insulated. From that, you can figure out which straight line. Now, how? Do you know mathematically what uh, no heat flow would be written as? The gradient is zero. The gradient of T is zero at the ends, right? That's called a boundary condition. Boundary condition. And mathematically, this is written as gradient of T with respect to X is zero for x equals 0 or x equals L. Okay, at either end, the gradient of t is 0. Okay, the answer is on the board, but tell me, how does this tell me which line I need? How does this tell me the slope? Uh, no. <laughs> yeah, you give me the answer. Right, so the answer was the gradient is zero at either end, and we know it has to be a straight line, which means the slope of the line must be zero. Okay. Uh, so yeah, that, that's how we can figure out that it must be a flat straight line. Okay, yeah, again, these are very simple things, but once you start looking deeper into how exactly everything fits together, uh, you, you get a sense of how everything is connected. Okay. So let me write down the answer. Uh, gradient del t by del x at ends is zero, which implies that slope of final straight line must Everywhere. Okay. Uh, for one of the initial projects, uh, the, the idea would be to solve this sort of a problem uh, where you hold one end at 100 degrees and the other end at 0 degrees and figure out how the profile looks like at steady state and even how it evolves in time. So, all of these things. Uh, are the things we are looking at right now are relevant uh, for what you do later on. Okay, so we still haven't talked about any discretization. Um, let's see. Before discretizing this, how would you solve this? Let's, let's make it simpler. Let's solve with the one d equation. So, analytical solution first. Analytical solution. Uh, 
So for that, we have the governing equation, the two at t by that x squared, and then we have the initial condition, which might be p at time equals zero, comma x equals some function. In, 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 in this case, my function initial condition was a Gaussian fit. And then you have the bounding condition. So this is IC. Then you have the DC, which is del D by del X at X equals zero equals zero. X equals L equals zero. Or you might have other bounding conditions, which might be P at all time and X equals zero is 100 degrees centigrade. Okay. So this is the basic, um, the, the, everything you need to solve the equation is right here. And the way you would proceed that is you would use um, separation of variables. If you remember that. Where you say your p is a, which is a function of both x and t, can be written as x of x and uh, say y of t. Then you substitute that in here. Then t plus equal of kappa, then x y, then x squared, and so on. Right. So for this very simple physical problem, it is feasible to do this analytically. But when we start looking at much more complicated problems where we have non-linearities and we have multiple dimensions, this becomes much more difficult to do. And not because of multiple dimensions, mainly because of non-linearity. So that's when we must start using numerical methods. Okay? There's actually no analytical solution to the Navier-Stokes equation yet. If you can figure that out, you get a million dollars in that. That's late right. Um, so the only recourse we have is to do this numerically. So we can start with this very simple physical example and see how we can discretize it. The first time we were talking about discretization, we were we divided up our channel into small blocks. What should we do with our problem? Our rod. Make it in a point. Yeah, divide it up into points, right? So let's see. I will divide it up into four sections. Four? Okay, maybe even more. One, two, three. Um, okay. So we have one section, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. We've basically broken up in our rod into small elements. Okay, this is what we're doing is discretizing. And now we can label each of these points. Let's say i equal 1, i equal 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Okay. <clears throat> and our governing equation is this. So now we have to change these continuous derivatives to must be changed to um, discretized derivatives. Okay. They, they must be discretized. So let's look at the easier, easier? Uh, let's look at a simpler uh, example first. Um, I think we'll finish this example next class. But just to get an idea of what I mean by discretization, if you have a function um, y equal f of x, which is equal to x squared, right? This is just a parabola. And if you need the derivative over here, uh, 
So our parabola is again continuous, but I can discretize this as well, right? I can figure out, okay, uh, this is x equals zero, this is x equals one, this is x equals two. Um, I can figure out what the derivative is at what is it? That's basically the slope over here, right? And for this, it will be just x, 2x, uh, 2 times 3, yeah. okay. This is basically a slope of y at x equals 3. Now, how do we discretize this continuous variable? How do we do it numerically? This is doing it analytically. Taylor series expansion. Yes. So there's a whole lot of uh, there's, there's a whole lot there's a very nice logic behind how you derive these partial uh, these uh, discretized derivatives. But one very simple thing you can do right now without knowing any of that is <laughs> this is just the slope of the curve, right? And if I know all these x, y points, what is the x, y here? It's 2, 4, this is 3, 9, this is 4, 16. Uh, does this make sense, what I'm writing? Uh, or, yeah, it's just the points. And using these points, I can figure out what the slope is over here approximately, right? Um, let me see, we have two minutes. Okay, so tell me, what is one very simple way of Figuring out the slope using just those three points. There's three possibilities you can give me right now from these three points. Oh, uh, okay. I, I guess we don't have enough time. So we'll go on with this example of discretizing the EV equation uh, next class. Okay. And eventually you will use this in a homework problem. It, it gives you'll get very nice solutions, both evolving in time and statistics. Okay, so any questions? Again, email me for anything you want. And we will have office hours tomorrow. Okay, we have stopped recording, so if you have any questions here.